Kevin Carr and uh, Rachel Dixon from Montgomery. Well, thanks for coming from chilly Chicago to boiling hot Los Angeles. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> I wasn't supposed to be this hot. What happened? Uh, do you guys want to take a seat? Sure. Yeah, 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 I'd rather sit down, yeah, down for a second. Yeah. Sure. Um, you know, I was, I, you know, I brought up a few questions, and obviously, you know, it's sort of housekeeping. I'll open it up to the audience, and you know, if you have a, a, you want know, to raise your hand, if you've got a question, but I want to sort of springboard um, immediately um, the the elation at the end because it's just such a fantastic ending. Um, I mean, you caught that at the right time um, as they're enjoying you know, the party. Was Had you any idea that that news was going to be announced at that time? Can you talk about that? Yeah, I don't think we had any idea that that was going to come down. You know, uh, when they had won the injunction, that was like the victory that was good enough at the moment. And then we knew that um, there was probably going to be some more, more weeks of filming. You know, like this is just the beginning, just like Elizabeth said in the in the film there. This was just the beginning. They still had a, a long road ahead, a long legal battle ahead. So when that news started circulating in the air, it was a total shock to both of us. Um, we were happy that that happened. But uh, also, I was a tad sad because I knew that that was the end of our movie. And I knew that was probably one of the last times that we were going to film. And we did film a little bit more after that, but I knew that our, our filming was coming to an end after that. And, and just this, this time of being with this community uh, in this intimate, intimate setting was, was going to end. Yeah, and it was really it was a moment of disbelief. I think we could barely believe what was going on. And as you can see in the film, the people there didn't really believe it. But it was really nice that we got to film that moment because we weren't able to film in the courtroom, which also was like a jaw drop moment that we kind of saw the aftermath and we heard it described to us, but because we didn't get that permission, it was nice to see when people realized the fight was finally completely over. And just sort of, it was just a, you know, absolutely spectacular. And uh, so I'm going to sort of move back uh, to the sort of the beginning. Um, and, uh, you know, and just for the guys in the audience, I mean, I, my sort of background, although you can tell that I'm, you know, obviously not from around here, but from Scotland, but I have been here for a long time. And I, my background is very much uh, implanted in sort of community, sort of activism, and also engagement, uh, and primarily sort of around actually the, the school systems. Um, and I've seen a lot of documentaries um, on schools. And the thing that I just absolutely love about this film is the voice that you give to these amazing students and it's something that I have not seen before and can you sort of can talk about the decision as a filmmaker that you made to present these amazing kids um, in that way because I feel that it's so powerful and yeah it's just incredible so can you talk about that? I mean, I, I, I don't think it was a decision that I necessarily made. It was a decision that uh, was obvious to us because the children were so in front of uh, the fight to save NTA. Uh, they were the ones that were really the voice and the power. They were learning everything that they had learned through school, right, at NTA. They're learning more. When they're talking about civil rights, they're not just talking about Martin Luther King and Rosa Parks, right? It goes much deeper than that. And it happens at an early age for them too, you know, as early as kindergarten. So, like, they are understanding at that age what uh, injustice looks like and what a battle for civil rights looks like. And so, they had an opportunity here in this intimate fight to save their own school to actually utilize some of those tools that they learned in the classroom and now bring them out into the street, you know. And I think the one thing that's great about uh, particularly the eighth grade class, you know, Taylor and Marie and, and those, um, you know, they, if the school ended up transitioning into a high school, like they wouldn't have been affected at all, right? They, they would have graduated and they could have just been like, oh, well, but, you know, they were fighting for the kids behind them, you know, the seventh, sixth, fifth graders, etc. And that's something that I really took to that I thought was admirable of them. That it wasn't really just about them, it was about, you know, the, the future of the school. 
Yeah, I mean, it, we were just kind of capturing what was going on. Those yeah. those um, students were really the force behind a lot of the protests, a lot of what was going on, and they were really driving it. So I think we were just kind of capturing what we saw. And you had unbelievable access in the school. I mean, did you just full rain? Did you just just <laughs> let you just do you, you go where you wanted and in the school because it's pretty remarkable and the, the the trust that you had as well i mean obviously at the beginning you could tell with um you not so much but you definitely could see that they were just very uh, trustful with you being there well i mean that trust was was earned uh through working with the administration through working with isaac castle as their principal obviously it stated in the film uh the the immense risk that he was taking uh in allowing us to, to film in the in the school, it's not something that the school district would normally would have allowed. Uh, we did ask. I did ask naively in the very beginning, you know, if I could if I could film, and uh, luckily for us, they never responded. <laughs> but we always knew that Isaac and I, we had always talked about what we were doing and should we be doing it and what risk we were putting everybody at. And so throughout the course of the, the filming over those years, like we would have conversations about this every day, you know. And uh, we had to make sure that we were protecting the sanctity of the classroom, sanctity of the school day, uh, the children. Uh, making sure that we're not, um, you know, um, being uh, exploitative or being a distraction to them in the classroom. And also then, you know, working directly with the families and getting all of their permissions and all their, um, you know, getting our releases from them, which was a major task. Uh, and that's something that we're doing without the, um, without the permission of the school district, you know. So, you know, it was, it was a lot, it was very risky on everybody's end very stressful uh i didn't necessarily enjoy being in the school all the time because of that stress um but i think just the joy of, of them being with uh all the participants kind of helped alleviate that and took my mind away from it i think too it was helpful that um kevin knows liz from middle school they went to middle school together and having that personal connection being able to tell a story that you have, you know, you know someone personally from, I think that's really helpful too, because then she was able to introduce Kevin to Isaac and he did pretty much, you know, he would introduce us to whoever we, whatever teacher we wanted to film with, that, you know, he kind of made all those connections and bridges for us so that we really did have so Elizabeth Greer. Yes. Okay. Yeah, so Elizabeth Greer and I were uh, elementary school classmates. We had uh, grown apart as elementary school classmates do, like she left our school in eighth grade or whatever, in ninth grade. And, um, but we reconnected on, on Facebook and she was posting stories about NTA and her fight to save NTA. And my memories of Elizabeth back in elementary school were a lot like uh, the student Yah here in the movie. You know, she was very quiet and shy and um, intelligent. Uh, and the Elizabeth that I saw then now uh, out here fighting to save NTA was totally different. You know, she was like Shirley Chisholm, she was Angela Davis, all wrapped into one. She was very forceful and um, driven. And so it was those two ideas of, of A, just the, uh, the injustice of trying to close down NTA, which was a story, I, um, you know, worth pursuing. But then this idea of just an average everyday citizen kind of uh, stepping into their power, recognizing that they can be an activist. I think we all have a little bit of activism in our hearts, you know, we just need a little spark to kind of activate that. Uh, and I noticed that certainly with Elizabeth and then with all the parents in the community there at NTA who now were galvanizing and uh, organizing, you know, in this fight to save their school. Does anybody have any questions in the audience? Did you uh, have a plan, or what? What are your thoughts? What would have happened if uh, the the court had decision had gone completely the other way? Well, our plan was to keep filming, you know, to give finality to the story to see what was going to happen. But the um, the activists, uh, the school community, did plan to keep fighting. They had talked about doing a hunger strike. Um, Liz talks about chaining herself to the doors of the school. They did not, you know, they weren't going to really take failure for an answer. So from our understanding, they were prepared to continue fighting 
and we were prepared to continue filming. Did you have any um, discussion or did you film the lawyers as they were working the case? Because it's so interesting the fact that it's the first sort of racial discrimination claim that they actually won. And that component is obviously huge, especially knowing that all of this, the other schools had been closing um, and none of them had won. But this one, based on what was with the same we saw in the film, um, they obviously it was a really strong case and they did win. But um, did you have any access to the lawyers? I mean, we were cool with Candace and her team, but uh, that was the one thing she said. She shut the door on that. I was like, no, can't, I can't, I can't let you have see see these meetings and stuff. So we didn't we didn't get an opportunity to film any of that. Yes, uh, Kevin, you uh, were able to work on the uh, America B uh, documentary. How did that help? Kind of. Um, influence your direction in this and you know that not just influence but kind of help you navigate some of the um, you know the school structure and all of that kind of things and kind of the second question also how did your early work at other places help influence what you're doing with this film and today uh, the first question with America and me that was a huge influence on the making of this film, particularly just in terms of navigating uh, the school structure and the logistics of like uh, working in a classroom, not only filming in a classroom, but then you know gaining that uh, access and trust first with the teachers and then with the students and then with the families. You know, with America and me, when we were filming in those classrooms, we, uh, Steve and all the directors, we would have these meetings ahead of time with the teachers to let them know what we were doing, and uh, we basically had to get their sign off. And a lot of times we didn't get the sign off to film in their classrooms, but um, just having that, um, the, the knowledge of being able to do that, to like build that relationship first with the teacher, was something that was very important, and that was something that we definitely used uh, in this in this film and then obviously in terms of getting um you know the trust of the students and the parents and everything uh and because we didn't have the um the permission of the school district usually the school district would help kind of facilitate all the releases and stuff like that and we knew that we couldn't really do that in this instance uh we had to do it on our own so we had to work with the administration and and we had to uh, go and get the releases ourselves from from a lot of the parents and everything, and, and we, you know, some of the teachers helped us get those releases and, and and all that. So that was all things that again I had learned from American Me because like all the all the students in that in that uh, series they all were released, you know, all the ones that wanted to be in it, and um, so that was something. Those were two big big uh, lessons. And then in terms of just like. Uh, my prior work, um, I think because really this film is made between me and, and Rachel, you know, it, should, it was primarily us who were in the building and in the community for the majority of time. Um, I think I just learned how to make a film with a small crew, you know, and being able to take on uh, different tasks, you know, as a director, cinematographer, and editor here and we both produced this i produced a lot you know in my past so i think all that kind of helped in this whole whirlwind of what we're doing right now trying to get this film out to uh to to the masses and you know we've been able to do that and we're going to be on pbs in december and you know as an independent so to do all these things independently all my prior work and in, in past definitely helped uh, for, for this to materialize. Yes. Great work, fantastic film, fantastic journey. Um, I'm curious for both of you, when did the two of you know that this was going to be a film? And when did the two of you start to sort of piece that out and say, this is going to be my five-year journey, six-year journey? <laughs> and secondly, we'd love to hear how the school is doing now and how the people that we've grown to love on screen are in today's did, world. Did you hear that? <laughs> Um, well, yeah, the question was first, how, when did we know this was going to be a film and we are going to start this journey, and then how is the school doing now? So I think, I mean, I think when we started there, we had the intention of making a film, I think, I mean, we were filming it, 
<laughs> but <laughs> so, <laughs> but I guess I mean there was talk for a while of making it a series as opposed to a, uh, as as opposed to a feature length documentary. There was a lot of footage, of hours, hundreds of hours of material. We had you know more interviews, more scenes in the classroom, more scenes at some of the students' homes. Um, but in the end, I mean, kind of can talk a little more about that. But we decided that it made sense to, to make it a, a film. I mean, I think I always knew it was going to be a film because you had an end goal, you know. There was conflict and there was uh, a journey ahead with an end, you know. Was this school going to stay open? Were these parents, students, and educators going to succeed in this task or were they going to fail? So we had an end and we were just marching toward it. So I always believe that it was, it was going to be a film, there was going to be conflict, um, there was going to be opportunity to dive into these issues of race and class and power and privilege and, and a form of racism that is not easily um, identified, you know? I think it's easy to identify racism when you're talking about you know, white supremacy, KKK, whatever it is, but when you're talking about this kind of racism when you're talking about dog whistles and things of that nature um, you know that that's a little bit more nuanced but this is an opportunity to dive into that conversation this opportunity to look at gentrification in through the lens of education you know in a way that uh, hasn't been done before so I think I always knew it was going to be a, a story and a film what length it would be was was to be determined um, I think at the end of the day, we just felt from the narrative drive that uh, a, a shorter feature length was probably best. And, um, you know, I think we're all good with that. And then in terms of, like, what's going on with NTA right now, do you, you want to say? Sure. Um, I mean, the school's doing really well. They still have a really high ranking. Um, we do hear that our, the neighborhood is continuing to gentrify. So there's also a, there's a gifted program in the school that just started at the younger grades. And so that has caused some um, like tracking and segregation within the school, which is problematic. But I think the administration is doing their best um, to keep the same spirit alive. I think uh, Isaac, he resigned as the principal of his own. CPS didn't fire him. He just decided that his time there was over. So now he's working as an educational consultant. And Tanika Brooks, who was the assistant principal, she's now the principal. Courtney Langston, who was the eighth grade teacher you see in that one scene, she is now the assistant principal. Um, the, so, you know, Liz's kids are, you know, growing up. I think, um, you know, the school's doing really well. Um, the eighth graders are now uh, headed to college. So Taylor's going to Georgia State. Um, and, uh, you know, Yah is uh, at one of the top high schools in the city of Chicago. There is now a new plan bubbling for um, a high school to be built. There's, I, you can see in some of the footage in front of NTA, there's like a big empty lot where the Harold Ickes homes used to be. And they're planning to, or there's a plan to build a high school there. But the community is very upset because that land was promised to be rebuilt into mixed income housing and subsidized housing for the residents of the AQs to eventually be able to come back. Right now they've been displaced all over the city. And um, so there's still this push, and what Liz and some of the other community members will say is there are viable high schools. There are high schools, every, uh, every student in the city of Chicago is assigned a neighborhood high school. But the issue is that the high schools are under-enrolled and, un and underfunded in that neighborhood, and so they don't have really high rankings and a lot of the, the parents, the gentrifying parents, do not want to send their children to these high schools. And so they want a high school option that you don't have to test into, that their kids can just automatically go to. And they feel that having um, the high school there, building a new high school is the best option for them. So there, there's still a lot of conflict going on. Did you ever hear from our, uh, Aaron and John, um, John Jacoby, the the, the two who were sort of fighting for the school. Uh, the day. You're talking about Tina. I'm sorry, Tina. I'm sorry, yeah, Tina. Do we ever hear from yeah, Did you no, hear? I didn't hear anything about No, we didn't. Um, you know, okay. <laughs> and, and I assume that the Chicago, uh, the CP have not seen the film. 
I mean, uh, to our knowledge, they have not seen it. I mean, our film screened in, in Chicago in early August at the Siskel Center for a whole week, um, <laughs> three showings a day, so maybe they snuck into a matinee and, and checked it out. Uh, but to our knowledge, they didn't. They haven't seen it. You know, the entire school system has, has flipped in terms of the CEO and the Board of Education, so you have entirely new people there now. None of the people that are in this film are currently in, in office anymore. Um, so there was talk that the new CEO did want to um, see the film, um, and we were negotiating through some intermediaries to do that, but uh, it just kind of lost steam. So I don't know what, what's going to happen. Maybe, I think our next big public push is going to be when the movie hits on, on PBS nationally, and um, I don't know, they, at that point they can watch it for free, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, well, I think we've only got time for maybe you know, a couple more questions if you've got any in the audience. Right here. Two simple questions. One, I know you're trying to stay objective, but do you think just being there, did you influence any decisions or bring anybody to the fold, even indirectly, like whether a lawyer agreed to get involved knowing that this story is becoming bigger? And second question, I know capturing footage, getting releases is one thing, but then in the editorial process with children involved, were there any issues with that, of having anybody being able to see the edit since children are going to be in the final cut? Uh, right, so t t t tell me the first question again. It was um, just being there, did you? Did oh, did you we influence? Right? Yeah, we didn't influence anything. Yeah, I mean, we were, we were just there, you know, and so uh, those lawyers had already come on pro bono to work with, um, work with the team, work with the parents, so uh, we were just there. So we didn't, we didn't influence anything in that, in that regard. Um, and then as far as like the edit, uh, I, I kind of come from uh, the background of, of like cartoon with films and, and what they like to do is they like to show uh, um, early cuts of their film to the film participants, the main film participants, not necessarily to give them a, um, an opportunity to have a final cut, but at least to have conversations about the edit and the story and their portrayal and everything. And, you know, if there's some pushback, then let's have some dialogue about it, understand where uh, we're coming from, from a filmmaking uh, standpoint. And so I did that uh, for sure with all the film participants in our in our film, um, especially with the ones who children were, um, were front and center and didn't have any pushback at all from anybody. Uh, I did have, um, you know, one or two parents who saw cutaways of their kids in the in the uh, early cuts that didn't want their kids in there, and so we, we took them out. Question. So I think that counts as two questions now. Um, so anyway, um, no, but, but thanks so much, everybody. I really appreciate it. But, but the film is actually moving to the uh, Lumley Monica Film Centre over uh, for, the, for a week run. Uh, so please tell your friends, tell everybody about it, um, tell them to come out uh, and check it out um, because I'm sure you guys enjoyed it and everybody else will too. Um, and so thank you so much uh, for tonight. It's great to see you and uh, thanks and um, and all the best with the film. Is there anything else you want to add apart from POV, PBS? Anything else? Yeah, no, it'll be on a P on PBS uh, December twelfth, so everyone can watch it. It'll be streaming for a month online after that. And um, we're also starting a community engagement process, educational distribution as well. So there are plenty of opportunities. We have a website, lightshinefilm uh, dot com, and social media, so you can share the film if you feel so inclined. Thanks, everybody. Really appreciate y'all.